Yes, yeah, so I'm going to present you a little bit what I've been doing in the past 10 years and a bit before. So for the people that know me, I really love electronics very much. And I currently uh, kind of devoted my life to electronics. But way before that, actually, I started as a ballerina. So I was dancing for 10 years, uh, classical ballet on the stage. So as Nika mentioned, I grew up in Romania in a very small town uh, at the edge on the border to Hungary called Timisoara. Um, and there we had this uh, wonderful opera filled with like uh, red velvet, a material that would dominate my works uh, later on. And while I was doing this uh, classical ballet, I was uh, dressing up a lot in pink and wearing a lot of makeup and kind of um, submersing myself in the stage world. And it's inspired my later practice, so I will come back to that. But while I was doing that, I was also drawing a lot and I was drawing this kind of abstract lines and then it came to me that what I was actually drawing all the time were sounds. But this I discovered way later. And so soon kind of I kind of arrived to electronics because I realized that electronic circuits are drawings. They are like the, the electrons in the drawing move from one component to the other. And this small interaction that they do, which produce sounds, are in a way uh, pieces of dance. So for me, it kind of all made sense. Now I could combine my expertise in drawing, my pleasure of drawing, with the one of dancing, and I could create machines that move, at least in the inside. So I started to do this little uh, point-to-point -point soldering uh, circuits, little machines. At the beginning, they were quite pointless and very dysfunctional. But I, um, I decided that maybe Romania is not the best place for me to learn this. So I packed my things and I left to Berlin, where I learned electronics by myself mostly, but also assisting a few artists. So while I was in Berlin, of course I had no money, you know, sexy, poor, young, uh, and some people started to donate me a lot of trash because they had they were older artists. They started to donate me electronic waste. Um, so this is how this series of works came to from leftovers of other people. Uh, I call it call this series on the peripheries of electronic wastelands, and these are very old works of mine. I just show them for context how I started. So I, I started to imagine, okay, we, we create all this waste, all these uh, pieces of hardware, they fall on the ground, and they, they kind of start to accumulate uh, as a layer, on, as a geological layer on Earth. And then I thought, like, how, what kind of life would emerge in this uh, geological layer, and how would this sound? So I kind of made a speculative imagination exercise and created these pieces. This is a Zurkobuk Nuk Stridens. It's a stridulating creature that imitates the sound that crickets make when they make love. Yeah, so I started to play with what you can do with this, uh, with this technology, yeah, which actually comes from military. So it was also fascinating to see how you can change kind of the initial use of these devices. Of course, we use these circuits in every logical uh, thing, such as a computer or so on. This piece, I made it as an intervention in South Korea. So I was invited there to in a residency. And, uh, you know, in South Korea, they used to have this beautiful market in Seoul where they would uh, handcraft the parts. And I thought it was, uh, it was gorgeous to see people just making these parts as a craft. Um, and also, like, you could order them and so on. But this market got demolished because of they wanted to build a big commercial uh, shopping center on top of it. So this was actually the last three days of the market that I caught there. And um, I took some of these coils, which some I have there, and they, you can see them Sunday on the performance, because some I kept. And I created this creature in a crack of concrete that would kind of make little movements where the market was. I left it there. It kind of got destroyed. 
Um, I have a, a piece of it, which was exhibited this year, but it's a, a work that kind of degraded. And then I was interested to see also like, what, how about organic materials, so slowly entering into another area. Uh, I was interested in speakers and how, what produces sound. So I realized that you can build speakers and you can build them out of anything, including leaves. So these are leaf speakers um, that produce also organic sounds and the sounds of course I was composing with the circuitry so as I was I said before this drawing is the circuitry is the thing that makes the sound so I I would compose by connecting different parts and kind of intuitively uh, working my way out I don't have an engineering background so I don't know if this is correct or not but I I like to present the diagram next to the work so people could see like more or less what is going on inside so this is Thermofrunzus, a creature that um, interacts at uh, temperature fluctuations, and it has these leaf speakers. Coming a bit more to the present time, because this is very old work, um, I, I got interested in the actual phenomenon of, of networks, and um, especially trees and their networks. And because it seems that trees are arg organisms that behave as aerials, so an aerial is an antenna. An antenna captures the electromagnetic uh, vibrations of Earth, of the air. So. And I thought it's kind of interesting because trees also have this uh, circuitry that is underground. So it's called the wood wide web, the internet of the trees. And they communicate with these little uh, signals that are kind of entangled in the roots. So you have the tree, you have the roots, you have the mycorrhizal networks, mushrooms basically. And it's a large circuit. So if one tree, for instance, uh, suffers a damage, it would signal the next tree and so on. So they really work in a network. So on one side, on the underground, trees are in this internet, their own internet, but on the other side, um, in their crown, they seem to capture our internet, yeah, the, uh, our telecommunication, our radiation, uh, what we use wireless and so on. So I was wondering what happens when these two uh, kind of types of network collide, which they do in this organism. So. I looked into the history and I found this patent uh, by Giorgio Squire. This is an American inventor who in the 20s, he decides to put a nail in a tree. And he connects the nail to a receiver and he receives radio. So he makes the discovery that a tree bark, or not bark, you would say, yeah, the stem, the whole tree, the wood part, um, behaves exactly like an aerial because of the way the leaves would face. If there's no leaves, it doesn't receive as well radio as if it has foliage. So I checked how to do this actually without putting a nail in the tree because when you put a nail in the tree and if that nail is not the right metal, you can kill the whole tree. So I, I found this uh, declassified army patent uh, where you can see there is a coil, a uh, toroidal coil that would go around the tree embracing it and would in this case, it would be used to transmit radio through the tree. So the tree becomes a transmitter. In my case, I use it to receive. So by receiving, not damaging the tree, because when you transmit, you would power up this tree like in a high voltage. And why would you do that? Well, it was believed for a few years, and this experimental guy, Giorgio Squire, thought that we could use the forests of Earth for our own communication, which in a way maybe sounds interesting, but in another way sounds very problematic because it's been studied these days that trees are really suffering for the, from the urban radiomagnetic waves. So if you have in a city a tree, there's a German study which shows that uh, where there's a, you know, these towers of televisions with a lot of antenna, in that side the tree loses all its leaves. So it's really um, 
and disturbed by this. So I thought, well, how can I show the amount of this disturbance that happens in the ecosystem of information of the tree? So I set it up a prototype. I took this hammock coil, and like George Squire, I uh, hooked it up to a little receiver, and this is the transmission that I got. <laughs> is in Berlin, but it was a ra Romanian radio that I just happened to capture because I was in this uh, forest and I, I don't know how it happened. It was a coincidence. I was very happy and I was excited and I was like, okay, okay I need to make a work with this. So I, I started the, the piece, which is called Arboreal Receptors. Um, the first uh, arboreal receptors, number one, they were wearing solar panels and they were designed for a park in a small town in Austria. And they ran for like three months until rain took them off completely. Um, the second series was produced for Berlin and this was placed in a public park and it was very interesting because how the people were interacting with the works but also while the works were capturing uh, during the night they were quiet during the day there was a lot of interference so you could hear different noises and sounds uh, so the circuitry the circuitry is very simple it's following one of the earliest radio uh, radio designs and that's a crystal radio it's basically a crystal radio with three components that kind of embraces the tree and there's a preamplifier so what you see up there this there uh, that's the preamplifier and there's one crystal uh, diode with which demodulates the sound so we can hear it so i kept i made five of these pieces and then i made five more and i started to present them in different places. Of course, I would get different results depending on the location I would put them. In a busy city, there would be a lot of noise. In a quiet place, there would be mostly silence. So it was more like also trying for me to understand this phenomenon better. And then I thought, well, I, you know, I worked on this quite a lot. I have the circuits. It's kind of functional. All my works are kind of functional. So I thought, well, if I have this thing, it's a little bit a pity not to share it. So I uh, decided to do workshops and um, to teach what I just discovered. So I made the circuit. I put it in a in a format where I could share it with people. It's and this was the uh, autonomous energy harvester workshops, where we would just uh, wander around with this crystal radio that would be quite compact um, and it had the solar panel so it was basically the same crystal radio that was in the arboreal receptors and that was the first no school actually the first workshop in the first no school um, so then after this series of work so I, I did much more of those little pieces creatures I call them my creatures um, I thought well I'm working with this field but I really want to understand what electronics are and what is the better way to understand by going to the most important component and that's the transistor so the transistor is one of the most important invention that we created in the 20th century it has brought us the information technologies and I started to look in the history of what it where it comes from in the history of solid state so minerals um, and that's where I found that actually way before the invention of transistors, so in the 50s, there were a lot of people experimenting with different stones and creating uh, basically the fundamentals of radio telecommunication. Uh, and one of them was Oleg Loshev. So Oleg Loshev, a Russian scientist, he he invented basically a synthesizer in the 20s by taking a piece of zincite, so a crystal, a very red crystal, um, and touching it with uh, a little piece of metal. He was able to obtain an oscillation. So the circuit would look very simple. There's like two components and the third being the semiconductor. So I thought, well, that's very interesting. I would like to recreate that. And why? Because I thought it would be very interesting as a workshop to teach people how to build their own transistor. 
So a transistor in these days is very har hard to DIY. These are uh, components that are highly sophisticated. They're produced you know, in factories, in clean rooms, with a lot of equipment. Um, and it's almost, there is no way that you can kind of get a bit of tangibility to these components. They're very sophisticated. So I thought I want to break down this process to a point where people can actually uh, build their own semiconductor. So this is sizzling semiconductors, the workshop that Nika talked about, the workshop that I will be teaching here. So the ones that the people that, if there are people in the public that will participate, we will really dive deeper down into this. And also on Sunday, I will give a, a pre-talk on the history of semiconductors. So I created these instruments, which are little uh, synthesizer you can call them I guess maybe it's a bit stretch and they use crystals some are like um, burned metal like this one some are pyrite and some are mix I started to build them with people, like with lots of people, because I think it's more fun. And uh, then I started to create these ensembles. So we create an orchestra, it's called the Screaming Minerals. And we enact this uh, kind of funky instruments that are um, handmade, and we try to make a, more or less of a score with it. Um, and then I, I thought of this new format, which I will present on Sunday, which is kind of a, in between a talk, a performance, and screaming minerals. So I guess this is more you will see on Sunday if you come. So coming to something a little bit more fun, coming and I will go back to my childhood as a little ballerina. Um, these things had a big impact on me, so I kept looking in the history of beauty and makeup. Um, and particularly, I found this device very fascinating. This is called the beauty micrometer, and it's uh, invented by this one man, Max Factor. You might know it as a, it's a cosmetic brand. Uh, he's on the right. And this uh, machine was designed to measure facial imperfections so that you can apply the right amount of makeup. And one day while walking on the streets of Berlin, I find this box and it is a makeup box and I decide, oh, well, I'm going to take it and I'm going to transform it in an instrument. So I start to build my first device. Then I find a box for wigs and I, I, I build uh, the second instrument. And soon enough, I had a little uh, ensemble of instruments and I could start performing with these things. Um, I took my shoes and I put microphones into them so I would come and kind of drag my feet on the stage, make a lot of noise. Uh, then I took my other shoes and I started to build a kind of modular system, I guess you can call it. It is a modular system. Um, maybe you can say a Barbie rack or a Euro rack, Barbie rack, something like this. Uh, during the pandemic, I was slightly bored and I made this breast synthesizer. The concept is very simple. You can spin your nipples. Yeah, I never played it in the pandemic. It just seemed too wrong, but <laughs> there's still potential in there. Um, and then I thought, okay, I have all these funky instruments, but how do they actually sound? Because for me, it's not just about sound. I usually work with objects, and I work with the history of objects, as you might already notice. So I like to work a little bit with the tactility and the memoir inside an object. So I thought, well, I will work with lipstick, because lipstick is like both an instrument for oppression and liberation, uh, both in like, if you look in the 50s, uh, 
women that were housewives, they would use, like, lipstick would be a conventional uh, device to put on your face. But at the same time, in the queer community, lipstick was an instrument of liberation. So it's always like, if you look even backwards, so the ingredients that were used in this uh, device are kind of controversial. So we have arsenic, we have lead. So I thought, well, while I was soldering, you know, I solder with lead, I put lead on my lipstick, it's kind of poetic, like there is a kind of tangency. So I made the electronic lipstick, this is the instrument, where I could apply the lipstick while making a lot of noise, and I wanted it to sound a bit, you know, when you go to the dentist, there is this moment when it removes your cavities, and it goes like zzzz, yeah, that's how I wanted it to sound. So this is me uh, playing the electronic lipstick. <laughs> So it was, of course, not enough. I decided to do that with all the makeup devices. We have the eyelash curler, a strange device. When I lo looked at it, you know, it's like supposed to curb your eyelashes up, but it, it's it accidentally, I mean, it is clearly a switch. So I took this eyelash curler and converted it in kind of a sound releasing device. Then there's foundation, which is kind of like a layer, you know, you cover your face with a thick layer of something like a pate over your face. And I thought, well, this to me sounds really abrasive somehow. There's um, rouge, uh, there's blush. Um, so you put like a bit, you know, on your cheeks to make yourself rosy cheeks. Um, so for each of those uh, facial processes, I added a new applicator. That's foundation. with a whole trousseau. Um, and then I thought, well, when I will start performing this, it should follow the, um, you know, when you have YouTube tutorials, you have this like 10 step makeup routine. So I would take like the, the steps of makeup and just start applying it on my face while making these sounds. And the setup would end up something like this. At the beginning, it was very, very messy, and I had to carry a lot of small things, and they would always get broken. So during the pandemic, I thought, well, you know, there's like this dream in movie sets where they have this like makeup uh, ambulant beauty salons. So I wanted to build my own beauty salon, and because I had nothing to do, I did in the pandemic. So this is the Ambulant Beauty Salon, which I performed here is in the National Museum in Denmark, very fancy place near very fancy statues. Um, so I would come basically and spoil my face for half an hour. And I performed a lot coqueta, and people love this. Um, I got a little bit tired of it, but I, I have to perform it again in a, in a few weeks, in two weeks actually, in Zurich. So let's see how that goes. So meanwhile, I started to exhibit these uh, instruments as they are as kind of sculptures, because I made so many over the years. So I have like, I think, already 50 deviations of coqueta, like from shoes to lipsticks to so on. Yeah, so now uh, going to the more serious work. Um, besides uh, cosmetic interventions, I really like computers, but I really like old computers and the idea behind computing. Um, and one piece that I did last year uh, called Mineral Amnesia is actually about computer memory. 
um, and especially this little piece of equipment called the EEPROM. So an EEPROM is one of the earliest devices that we created to record things on. It is a memory, it's a computer memory that you could of course, it's, I'm talking about the digital, like so, semiconductor stuff, because there was tape, there was, you know, records and all, all, all other all other things. But in case of like digital technology, this is one of the first. And what is very interesting about it is that it has this little window, and through this window of quartz, you could erase the chip with light. So by exposing the chip to sunlight or UV light, uh, the memory would slowly fade away. And I thought this is very poetic, so I started to make a piece where I would erase in real time uh, samples of sound. Uh, of course, these EEPROMs, being so old, especially the ones from 72, uh, they can retain a very small amount of memory to what we consider today to be the digital memory. So we are talking about a few kilobytes, yeah. So at the beginning, it was very hard how to find, to, to retrieve these old pieces of hardware and how to program them because they're so old. So it's a very long story, which I'm not going to get into, but basically I, we ended up contacting the ex-CEO of Tesla, who happens to have a hobby for EEPROMs, and who happens to sell uh, EEPROM programmers, which he sold very expensive to us, although he's a millionaire. And <laughs> so we built this thing, and then we tried, and then we managed to make it work, but then the format that you use today called binary, like zero and ones, this was actually not working, so we had to use ChatGPT to like, like encode a modern format into that old Intel format. It was very crazy. Anyways, uh, this with my partner, Dorian. So we managed to do it. There's uh, uh, the EEPROMs are programmed finally. And then I, w I was just at the beginning just testing how it sounds. So this is a recording of my voice on an EEPROM being played again and again and erasing. Just a test. My voice on an EEPROM. This is a record of my voice on an EEPROM. This is a record of my voice on an EEPROM. So it goes on and on. It's uh, basically starting from a clean sample, and I start to decompose the sample as I play it again and again and again with the light, and it gets these digital artifacts, the noise, noisiness, are bits that flipped chemically uh, in the crystal because of the light exposure. A little bit like you would expose a photograph to light, you know, when you have a negative film and you open by mistake the camera, it's, the image disappears. So I made this piece and uh, I made a lot of them. I made 13 EEPROMs. Each of them is from a different year, so you have different fragments of sound. So starting with one EEPROM that would just, rec you could only record the waveform because it's so small, the memory up to one word, a sentence, and a phrase. So it's like you can see how uh, computer technology actually uh, evolved. Oh, <laughs> 1974, a microchip so small, it's too much. Yeah, so this was at uh, a festival in Romania, and uh, the, I was basically telling little stories about each EEPROM that would be erased in time. Here they were already mostly erased, also the acoustic of the space was really bad, but I tried to make a recording. Um, and then I, you know, I was working with all this like electronic equipment, as you see, like a lot of soldering and devices, and I realized I'm kind of getting bored of it because it's it's in a way, you know, I I don't find an alternative to it. And then one day I discovered this interesting technology called fluidics, 
which is uh, a technology that got developed in parallel with uh, electronics during the 60s. Actually, it started quite earlier on. So one day I just discovered a machine that looked a little bit like this, and I wondered what are those shapes inside that device, because they look very interesting, and they are apparently logic elements, they're circuits. So I was like, okay, I need to learn a little bit more about this. So fluidics um, or fluidic logic um, is basically doing the same thing like electronics, but instead of electricity, you have air and water, so different kinds of fluids, uh, that move along these geometries. The shapes are not random. The shapes are not there for aesthetical refinery. They're actually very functional, so form follows function. Um, and here, actually, you see there's also different scales of it. So there's very large fluidics, there's very tiny fluidics. Today, we also have microfluidics, which is another field that actually deals not with computing, but more with um, biological transformations and so on. But I was interested in computing. So uh, here we can see uh, an example of a fluidic circuit that was supposed to be sent into space but it was in the end not sent into space. Um, and why would this field be in a way more interesting than electronics? Well, as, as you see with the other piece, uh, electronics have the, the property of being very fragile, also to radiation, but also to environmental decay, because they're made of metals that corrode over time. But fluidics, and on the other hand, because it just functions with air, it can withstand high levels of radiation. So also during the Soviet times, in situations like Chernobyl, you could send a fluidic computer and nothing would happen to it, while a, an electronic computer would crash. Right? So this is also the case of sending something to space. Uh, a device that is sent to space has to withstand a lot of radiation. So this is where fluidics shine. The disadvantages, because they work with natural phenomena, so natural materials, they're way slower than their electronic counterpart. And this is the reason why the technology will be abandoned in the 80s, because it's just not so fast enough uh, to compete with the needs that we ha started to have. So the accelerated exponential growth in uh, demand for speed and computational power. So this is fluidics, these are shapes. Um, in order to make a fluidic computer, you would have to take these beautiful shapes and carve them in a material. So these can be etched or they can be milled or just transformed into some form of cavity into any material. This is from actually a book that I saw that somebody has in this institution too. Um, so just to explain how this shape actually work, here is uh, one of the only uh, videos that uh, shows a little description of the Quand effect. So the Quand effect, named after the physis physicist Henry Quand from Romania, is the effect that explains how uh, jets kind of like to stick on surfaces. So for instance, sometimes what happens is like you try to pour from a glass, and I'm not gonna do that, and instead of the water going on your other glass, it would stick on the surface, right? And make your uh, table wet. So that's very annoying. You try to pour and it's like going there. And this is because of the Quand effect. So the Quand effect makes that the stream of liquid, instead of flowing uh, upwards, it sticks to this uh, convex surface. So here is an explanation on that. Дефлектора турбуризует ламинарную струю. При приближении стенки струя примыкает к ней. Это явление получило название эффекта Куанда. С ним мы часто встречаемся в повседневной жизни. Рассмотрим, почему он происходит. Эжекционные расходы с обеих сторон струи равны. При приближении стенки сечение снизу уменьшается. Скорость эжекционного расхода растет, а давление падает. Поперечный перепад давления прижимает струю к стенке. 
Эффект Куанда связан с подсасывающим действием струи. Эффект работает и на затопленной струе. На положение струи не влияет появление дополнительной стенки. Оторвать струю от стенки может сигнал управления. Если его снять, струя не возвращается к первой стенке. Таким образом реализуется свойство памяти. So what he's telling there is very interesting because he's explaining that with this kind of effect you could deflect certain jets from one side to the other and if you, you would defect, deflect them with a little control signal and what would happen when you would remove these control signals is that the jets would remember to flow in one direction. So this is equal to the property that computers have which is memory. Yeah? You could create a computer memory with this simple Uh, procedure. So I thought this is kind of poetic and I did a piece called the fluid memory. This is quite an old piece from 22, 2020, yeah, 2020, um, in which I looked at how these shapes uh, work. Like I tried to kind of understand. Back then I had very little documentation because if you research this online, you're not going to find many f uh, books and things about fluidics. So I found this image and I tried to kind of deduce how these shapes work based on the quant effect. And I took the simplest shape, it's not the simplest, but it's the most common. It's called the fluidistor, so it's a fluidic transistor and it's the sh one shape that uh, can be used as a computer memory. I took it and I worked with a glass blower from Romania and we recreated it from glass and I tried to make to make it work. Of course, some worked better than the other because of the um, um, hand crafty uh, glass. So of course it's not perfect and the curves are not perfect. So they would work to a certain degree. And then I thought, well, I would like to make a shift register. A shift register is like a component of computers a more complex way of doing memory. So it's you take more of these bits and you create, it's like a Lego brick of a computer. So I took more of those shapes, I connected them together into a system that would always kind of feedback it itself, so the, the water would run from the top to the bottom and would keep, keep flowing. And this is the piece that came out of it, it's called the fluid memory. Um, and then I thought, well, I would also like to kind of uh, make this memory have a little impact when it memorizes, so you can see it and hear it. So I. I added a little sound component to it. By putting salt water in the machine, I would pass the salt water through two pieces of metal, and those metals would send a little voltage through the water. And this little device there with the spiral is actually a speaker. So each time the um, water would flow through a sensor, it would make a little sound. So you could see, well, now it's recording a one. And so now it's the memory is kind of active. Of course, it's, the machine is working and it's not working. As I said, most of my works are kind of working. So I would say 80% working. This is how it sounded like. It's a bit like a server. I thought, well, it's kind of interesting, but I would really like to make these shapes work properly. So that's when I started to research this a little bit better, and I went to the archives of the Technical University in Berlin, 
and I discovered some books, and I was interested in how these shapes are and what they are, because if you look, they look very clitorial somehow. They're very organic, and um, there is this one book actually called the, uh, the Guide to Fluidics. Yeah, so that's the one that Robert had at the physical computing department. It's here. Um, and in this book, you can see there is a logic gate, which is modeled after the human um, digestive tract and respiratory tract. So you have uh, things like um, oral cavity being an output, flow restrictions, and you have this, all this comparison made by physicists in the book. Uh, and you have this one shape, the equivalence element, that is inspired by the way we uh, breathe. And I thought it's also interesting how, like, how can you make these shapes actually work and how you could transform them in a way of prototyping circuitry. So I wanted to make a modular system in which these shapes could be plugged together to form, form different things. And one of the inspirations that I had for that was uh, the Volga jet system. So this is an old uh, way of building computers and machines. It comes from Soviet Union and they were using this in pneumatic machines uh, when building uh, things like controlling like robo arms in factories yeah, that lift and I don't know lift things from one side to the other. So these things would be usually pneumatic and we are talking about the 80s and they would still use these chips. So you have a main computer where you could plug these chips in and generate different computational devices. This is another uh, system, I think this is an American uh, system where there's the same idea, these are chips that you plugged together into one device and you can form circuits, very much like uh, electronic circuitry. So I thought, okay, there's all this historical documentation, all these patterns and things, I wanted to extract these shapes and first to try to make them work to see which ones work, and they're very hard to make them work, because basically these shapes have to be very, very precise. The angles, every angle matters a lot. Every cavity, every size, everything is super important. So these are the shapes that I managed to get out of these books. It's, I call it the fluidic alphabet. Currently I have around 14 shapes, from which like 10 work well, the other ones don't work so well. So there's still, I need to make more iteration and modifications. So I, I said, okay, I take them out and I want to prototype them. So the way I prototype them is I started to make these uh, modules and these pneumatic uh, aquatic modules. This is, for instance, what I called a non-binary counter because it's a binary counter, but it uses actually a way of an analog way of counting. So the one thing that I thought very interesting about this technology is that, you know, it does, it can be digital, it can be analog, but the way it flows, the way energy flows is very different. In a way, it is always much more fluid than the notions that we have about digital computing, because digital computing is yes or no, one or zero, right? And this is a little bit different because we're talking about a system that works with flows. So with um, jets, with movement and with fluidity. So I thought I will kind of find a way to first prototype these devices and then to show them into workshops, which I started to do. Of course, it's actually a very hard logistical workshop to do because they're very heavy and they're also like, it's hard to manufacture them DIY. So this, you have to machine them quite precisely. But this is a current research, so it's still there. I'm trying to push it forward. It's not really a proper, it's not a finished piece. I actually started to present some of them into uh, an exhibition uh, in, the, in, Mount, in the middle of nowhere in Switzerland. I was invited in a little hut to show a piece and I decided to bring these things which were very perplexing for the locals, like what they are. Um, but this is the fluidic transistor working with water. This was a cow, you know, where the cows eat. How you call a cow eatery? A cow bar. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know idea how it's called. 
<laughs> it's called garage in Romanian, but I don't know the. So then I was like, okay, I have the components. So the first step is you make the components and then you can kind of make something with the components. So the ultimate idea was, uh, this is a comparator. If anybody knows about analog computers, this is one of the building blocks of an analog computer. So this is from a historical pattern and I just found, find it very incredible how it looks like. So I said, okay, I have these uh, components and this year I want to build a computer. So I have the components and I want to build a computer. And you know, there's a lot of history behind fluidic computation. I'm not gonna get into this because I'm also gonna talk a little bit about uh, the history of computing on Sunday. Uh, but basically there's been many, many attempts of building computers and many successes with other things than electronics, including starting with ancient Persia, they did um, computers from simple balls that would sing. Uh, there's a lot of computers in China, like Susong's astronomical clocks with water and so on. Um, there's a long tradition. There's also this device, which I thought is quite interesting from the 30s. Um, it's called the Moniac and it was made to model the economy of Great Britain. And the way it would do it, it would do it with water flows. So, you know, money flows, water flows. So you could represent, you could model something just with the flow of water. So here is how the machine would look inside. So it would say, okay, my income is this tank, my income is filling. I hope so. It's filling and then, you know, it goes to different like parts and it's, you start spending it. So it's like just flowing from the main tank to additional tanks and so on. So basically in this piece I was looking at what it means to, to have a computer. Why, why do we build computers? And why, what compute, computing has as relevance to us? And I was looking at the early examples where computers were made, basically used as models for us to understand the outside world. So the first computers are usually clocks. The first, first computers are astronomical representation, so representing the sky. And I, I was just wondering like to which degree we kind of separated from this, like as a computer being a way for us to understand our world. And I started to assemble these shapes and to try to build my own fluidic computer from all these uh, organisms. So here's another example of a proper fluidic circuit. You see all these shapes are controlled. They're like combined. This is a fluidic adder, it's half of an adder. So an adder is like a calculator. I took half of that circuit and I replicated it twice and I made a full adder. So this, with this machine you could uh, add up uh, two binary numbers, like one zeros, like in ones and zeros, you could kind of add them up um, and get a result in a flow of water. And currently, like, I'm trying to develop this piece, which is called the fluid filaments, and I will actually end up here because I think I already crossed my time, more or less. Yeah, I'm good. So, yeah, this is the ending of it. Um, so, I, I currently am working on this field. I'm trying to get resources to push the research in fluidics. So, if anybody has heard of fluidics or knows anything about fluidics here, or if this is a trendy thing, I want to hear about it. <laughs> because I'm, I'm very interested in, in developing this project a little bit forward. And, um, yeah, this is supposed to be my first solo exhibition in November in Berlin. Let's see if it happens with Zingur. Uh, I will work on this large fluidic machine that will also make sound because you can also build fluidic oscillators that make whistling sounds, so which is, uh, is something that I prototyped, but I have only very small shitty videos on my phone, which I'm not going to show. But they do work, so I get already sounds from the oscillators that I'm prototyping. So yes, thank you very much. Uh, if you have any questions, I'm very happy to answer them. So the images that you showed of the different uh, fluidic components, they were all line drawings that were in two dimensions. And so I'm wondering if there's like a requirement for the third dimension, like if it can be spherical, like you did with your 
um, blown glass example or? Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, basically, the way these shapes work right now is that they do work as a two-dimensional. The, these plates, the shapes that I have here, they have uh, they are two-dimensional because they work with the the curvature of the how to say the in between of the two planes is the one that guides the stream. So also like the um, like how thick or how big you make the shape is very important but you can do the same in three dimensions. It's just it becomes way difficult to control where the stream will get attached because you work with walls. You try to attach things to walls, like it goes like yeah? So if you have this as a sphere, it might get attached to any side of that sphere, you know? So it becomes, it is possible, it is just a way of thinking about, you're basically you're gonna design a new technology by doing that. So I also thought about it because when I did that spherical, the glass thing, I realized that it was kind of working differently than it was supposed to. And then a lot of people were like, oh, well, this is actually, uh, this is going into a different direction of computing. And I was like, okay, I, yes, fine, <laughs> you know, good. But uh, yes, I think it is a very important, it's very unexplored, you know. So if you're interested, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a, thing, a cool topic to go into, to research the three-dimensionality of how you can build these shapes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, just curious about um, the EEPROM uh, exhibit that you did. How the, the sound is stored on the EEPROM and then it fades away from the light, but then it, you said it gets restored. Yes. How does it get restored? Like what? I have to remove it? the EEPROM. And I have to program it again, and then I put back. Okay. All right. Okay. <laughs> it doesn't get restored. There's no okay. way to restore it. There's no way to restore it. Okay. No. no. <laughs> okay. So that's So each work comes with like four extra aprons. Okay. And you just you literally clip it, clip it out, and put the new one as if you would put a new record, and then the new thing is getting erased. So we thought about reprogramming it, but because each EEPROM generation has a completely different set of requirements to be programmed, but also read, it would have been like a massive engineering project, which maybe was not worth it for one artwork, you know. So you would build like customized programmers for each EEPROMs that would reprogram them. Yeah, it is possible, but I decided not to do it. Also, because I think it's just nicer to like completely erase and then like put a new one. At but the are you actually going to the display and putting it down? Like, I guess that's what, during the exhibit. No, during the exhibit is just runs in a loop, and usually it takes like some EEPROMs get erased in a week, some it, they see. take okay, a month. So, okay. But I let them until they go away. You know, it's been one exhibition where it was on for five months and then they got erased at some point in the gallery call like hey um there's people here the thing just make and there's like nothing left could you please come and put new eproms i was like okay okay i come and so i put new eproms but this was one case because it was such a long exhibition cool. yeah. uh, and then the other question i had was about the fluidics the is does gravity have any role in the way that these operate at all like the higher they are uh the faster they work, I, you know, I'm just curious about what role gravity plays in it. Yeah, uh, it's it plays a huge role in the water fluidics. So I decided to skip water at all completely because it's just so hard to make them work with water because of the viscosity and because you get air and water inside the system, it starts to create these bubbles and it's just, it's a mess to make it work. So the only shape that was properly working with the water was the fluidic amplifier, the transistor they were showing in that video. And that's why I showed that one because this is the one that worked actually. And the rest were not working well with water. And then I realized, I thought I'm making something wrong, but actually if I put pressurized air, so compressed air, the other ones were working flawless. So then I was like, okay, uh, they're mostly made for air. It's way easier to work with air. So now I'm uh, switching to air because of that, because I really want to have them working. And I also thought about a way to kind of maybe tint the air so that you see where the jets go, because otherwise the reason why I chose water is also because you can see it. Air you cannot see, but you can hear it. So that's also like a possibility. So yeah, gravity does play a role when you play with water, but it won't play a role, such a big role when you play with air. So with air is fine.
Um, I just wanted, well, first I wanted to say like, uh, it definitely hits a lot of my niche interests of these like early computers because I think now a lot of people take for granted how much memory they can put on any computer, how much connectivity, and that there's like a lot of rich material that you're tapping into with fluidic computers with like old style transistor radios. And I guess that leads to my question of like, I took a mechatronics course here that was a lot of analog computing and it was just kicked my ass. And I have some engineering background. So I was like wondering how do you approach some of these things where I know that there's like, a razor thin edge sometimes between it totally not working at all and working kind of where it's like how do you approach something or or trying to read you know a fluidics textbook from the from the 60s um, and like getting through that material and trying that out uh, I think I mean I approach it very more in an emotional way when I work with technology. I managed to get them quite working, and I think the example of the workshop that I will give on Saturday is a it's a very good example because the instruments at the beginning it feels like none of them will work, and at the end they kind of all work. Uh, so I think it's more a question of patience and really going in depth into details, you know. So you, I, I don't have any engineering background. I never studied this. I studied drawing and I danced, but that's all I did. But I, I don't know, I think in a way, if you approach it also just visually and you follow the paths and you just delve and you give it time, you know, this is the problem that I, I show you this works, but this is all I did in 10 years. I've been working very slow for me, you know, because I'm researching, I'm taking a year to like just go through these shapes and then I vectorize them and then I print them thousands of times and then I test again and again and again. So there's a lot of this process behind it, which of course, it's not clear in the output, but this is this is what this technology asks you to do. You know, it asks you to spend a lot of time into it to delve into the core of it. But I enjoy that. You know, I. So like, sorry. Um, has there ever been also a, a situation where you're maybe enlisting or asking for like, hey, this person who knows Flitics, kind of like what you asked at the end, like, why isn't this working? Or could you give me a pointer? I, I uh, worked, I made a friend because I gave a talk like this at CTM. Uh, this is a festival in Berlin, which is kind of, a, I don't know, where all the hipsters go. And, uh, <laughs> and I was there and I gave this talk on fluidics and there was this one guy, very shy, that approached me at the end and he seemed to be like a PhD in fluidics, which is a very bizarre, very niche, the nichest thing you can find. I was very excited. I was here and he was like, yeah, can we talk a little bit about it? I was like, yes, I will, uh, please. So we had a coffee and we met and it seems like I invited him when I was testing this prototype. So I just like, I made, I milled these parts and I was like, okay, I'm gonna test them in my studio. It's full of water. So I just like put trash, trash bags everywhere and I kind of sealed it and I was like, putting water everywhere and pumping in. And he came by and I was like asking him a lot of questions like, why doesn't it this work? And he's like, I don't know, I don't know. I was like, yeah, but you're a, you studied this, you're an engineer, like how do you don't know? Like, okay, I don't know, I tried to observe, but you, and then he was like, yeah, there's no way you can simulate this because fluid mechanics is one of the most difficult fields of physics because you have too many parameters behind it. So I was like, okay, but you know, I, I taught like, you know, digital technology, now it's so advanced, can't you simulate this? Like how water would flow, it, you should be able to do that, no? And he was like, no, it's super difficult. Like it takes a lot of computing power. And he was like, the only way that it works is like how you do it, just by testing. And I was like, seriously? <laughs> I was like, I thought, I thought there would be more behind, you know, but then I realized that I was actually following the scientific method because there's no other way to do it faster, you know. So, and then he told me also that nobody really touched the, the shapes and, uh, from the 60s, so the computing shapes. He was working with the fluidic amplifiers, but nobody really worked with this um, old computer, like logic gates and things like that. So yeah, I'm still in touch with him and I'm gonna work with his institute, the German Federal Material Research Center in Berlin, which will um, kind of help me prototype some devices because they have really precise machines. Yeah. I don't know if I answered the question, I don't remember. I think you did. <laughs> 
Um, I know that you said that you're, uh, you think about this in terms of like objects, um, but obviously when looking at these shapes, I think about architecture a lot. And you may have hinted at this in your um, upcoming Soul exhibition, but have you thought about uh, making like these larger, like kind of physical installations and like, or maybe you're like not attracted to that at all because then it loses like its objecthood. I'm just like curious about what you think about mm. that. Yeah, I mean, I'm, that's what I'm working on is this larger, it's like a filament. This is a large space. It's a huge, actually, space. And I'm trying to kind of draw these shapes in, in a geometry, like an architectural space. Because I, I usually, the reason why I do objects is because I had a very small studio. So I didn't have much resources. The, also, the budgets that people would invite me were very small. So then I would limit the size of the work to the budget. <laughs> Let's be, to be pragmatic about it, <laughs> it's about money, you know. So, and then now, because I got this opportunity, which yet I don't know if it will happen, fingers crossed it's a grant, but if we get this grant, then I could, I, I can make a larger space, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it's in the end also about money, mostly, unfortunately. I'm gonna go here, and then I'm gonna go there, and then I think we should probably stop. So stop thinking of questions. Hello. Uh, thank you for sharing your work. It's, it's so gorgeous what you've been doing. Um, and I really love when you said 80% of your things work, and sometimes they do, sometimes they don't work. And I think um, that's also very poetic. So I guess my question for you is like you're um, moving into these larger projects, and now you, you might be working with people who are specializing in these fields, and you can make like really precise instruments. Um, what do you think you will gain from working in that kind of um, facilities and resources? Uh, and also, what do you think you, you might lose if mm. you go down that route? Yeah, that's a very, uh, very kind of good, touching question because I thought a lot about it. Because so far I was working in very in an intimate way. I had this tiny room of 12 square meters where I was sleeping and working in Berlin. I was paying very little rent, so I could afford behaving like an artist. You know, I'm an artist because I had this very small costs. Um, and this allowed me to do kind of the best works I did because I was so connected to what I was doing. And this is one thing I'm afraid also like, yeah, when you go to a larger scale, to which degree do you keep this level of intimacy with the with your little creatures you know but i guess that's a question because it's going to be my first try i don't know i hope i won't lose that sense of joy you know because in the end it's also about pleasure like i think the moment you lose the the pleasure to do it it's visible you know so i i hope i mean i i can maintain my level of pleasure in working with these fluids and shapes and things let's see no idea Ginger, take us out. <laughs> I'm curious how much information you provide to audiences when your work is presented in a gallery setting, like with the e prongs and with the, um, the fluidics pieces, like the one in the barn. How, there's, how much of the technology do you want people to understand? Mm -hmm. um, like what kind of didactics, you know? Um, the history is really important to you. Mm. Yeah, I'm just curious about that. Yeah, so usually, I don't know how it happened, but I think I have never been in a white cube gallery, never, with this works. It's always a very weird place I'm invited to. <laughs> always. Like, that one place with the EEPROM was a tram uh, depot, yeah? The other thing was like this barn for cow, uh, I've been exhibiting in like old like power stations, abandoned water stuff, uh, parks, public parks, all kinds of places, but never really galleries. I think I only had I had performances in museum. I oh, yeah, no, the f one piece was exhibited in a museum, important one. Yes, okay, once, but mostly it's not uh, places that are um, how to say uh, specialized for a fancy audience. They're usually like uh, public spaces. 
And I like that a lot, that I get, for instance, now I got an invitation to do a piece of musical furniture outside in the public square in a small town. And I was like, this is such an odd invitation. I want to do it, you know. <laughs> like, so I always get these strange invitations. It's like, you know, I guess I just manifest this. Please give me weird invitations. Um, but to answer your question, yeah, this was also one of the things that I was thinking about because some works, I think if, it's nice if you just see them. So I try to make the works to have enough strength as they are, that they kind of stand for themselves. But sometimes I also want that people can, if they're interested, they can read more about it. So what I did for the fluidics things, I would usually print out a little booklet, which explained, like it had a, this historical patterns in it, and it kind of explained. I mean, it's already very obscure, but some people were interested into that. Um, and in the EPROMs, the same, you know, I made a little um, leaflet explaining. But what I mostly do is that because I get invited into weird places, I usually give talks and I explain this. So if I do an exhibition or like a residency on fluidics, I would definitely give a talk, you know, there. <laughs> because I think, I don't know how much... I'm just not a big fan of very fancy, sophisticated texts that are next to the work. I think nobody really reads them ever. Maybe a few people, you know, they just stay there on the wall. People don't read them. So that's why I try to make the work just stand for itself. And if some people are really like, oh, maybe I want to know more, then they access me and then we, con you know. And then I do the workshops, which I think is the best way to actually explain what I do, because there you have a one-by-one -one, you know, connection, and we talk about it, and we build together. So yeah, that's the way I do it. I don't know if it's the right way. Thank you so much.